Ladies and gentlemen, the great thinker whose work I'm going to introduce tonight is Han Feitzer, a political theorist. Um, excuse me if I, if I uh, uh, sort of move around and read from this. There isn't a lectern, so I'll be my own lectern as well. A political theorist who lived in the final years of the Warring States period in China, just before the final unification of the First Empire under Qin Shi Huangdi in 221 BCE. Just in case you are wondering which of these three syllables is the surname, a common problem with Chinese names these days, Han is the feudal state into which, uh, whose princely family he was born, Fei is his personal name, and Zi is the honorific title given to eminent teachers and philosophers. The name Han Feizi is well known in China as the greatest of the philosophers of the legalist school. His name is almost entirely unknown in the West, in spite of the fact that it was his political doctrines which enabled the Qin to consolidate their conquests and later Chinese dynasties to develop the sophisticated administrative practices which made governing a large empire possible over the long durée. Indeed, we can go even further and say that it was Han Fei's teachings or their implementation that led to the consolidation of a deliberately rational administration and law in China, including the development of the civil service examination system and all the other trappings of a meritocratic bureaucracy. Bureaucracy, of course, was originally a Chinese invention. It was transmitted to Europe in the 18th century by the philosophes and later spread uh, around the world thanks to the European imperial and colonial expansion of the 18th, 19th, and early 20th centuries. So in an important sense, the teachings of Han Fei are not just a cult cultural artifact pertaining to China alone, but rather should be seen as ancestral to our own society and culture as well. I must make a couple of apologies. First, you will have seen in the brochure for this lecture theory series that there is no picture of Han Feizi. I apologize for this. Uh, there are good reasons for this omission. Han Fei died young, effectively assassinated by his political rivals before any portrait could be commissioned. One could perhaps find a line drawing of him dating from the Cultural Revolution period, stern-jawed and solid in build, looking determinately out into the future, windswept. I decided in this case that nothing was better than something. <laughs> Another apology. There is no book stand selling the works of Han Feizi outside the lecture hall. I regret this, and I do not think you would have been disappointed had you bought a copy of his works. Alas, readings told me that the only publications available were imports. They ordered a small number of them overseas by slow boat, I expect, and they'll be there eventually. Um, actually, even in the Balliol Library here on campus, the work of Han Feitzer turns out to be remarkably hard to get at. There is only one copy of Burton Watson's English translation and one of two volumes of W.K. Liao's uh, translation of the complete works. Only one volume. The other volume is uh, in storage in a warehouse somewhere in the back streets of Brunswick. A final apology. There are no PowerPoint slides. Now, I think that Han Feitzer himself would have liked the idea of PowerPoint, uh, but in view of the likely circumstance that very few of you would have had any prior acquaintance with his work, I thought the best thing would be to spend some of the time in this lecture reading to you selected passages from his works. It's always better to let people speak for themselves in whatever form that takes, and that way, too, you can begin to form your own impressions and judgments of his thought and character. So, now, Han Feitzer, before I talk about Han Feitzer, I need to talk about not Han Feitzer. Uh, some of you may be wondering, why isn't he speaking about Confucius? Confucius, after all, is in the news, uh, what with Confucius Institutes and the new leadership of the Chinese con, uh, party state promoting a harmonious society, an ideal which is directly reflective of Confucian concerns for kindness and mutual respect in public life. 
and in direct contradiction also to Mao Zedong's injunction to never forget class struggle. So understanding something about Confucianism, yes, is indeed important for understanding contemporary China. I'm not going to do that here, but um, I will show you this um, little red book. Now, this may not is, be what you might think it was at first. This is a uh, selected quotations from Confucius, taken from the Analects, translated from classical Chinese into modern Chinese and into uh, English, and uh, pervaded around the world in this handy-dandy pocket size pocket edition. Beats penguins. On Confucianism itself, which does indeed have much to teach us about how to be good. More in a moment. On the other hand, those of you who came from the corporate world, is there anybody here? Um, anyway, you may be wondering also why didn't he choose to lecture on something really like, useful like Sun Tzu's Art of War? Well, Sun Tzu's Art of War has been making the rounds of the corporate boardrooms for quite a while now and its well-known maxims about how to fight 100 battles and win 100 victories, uh, and how to win without fighting, uh, have become reasonably well-known. The answer I would put to you is this. Uh, Sun Tzu's Art of War is much less useful than it's been made out to be. It's a handbook for generals. Uh, even by analogy, um, its lessons are of questionable value for CEOs, and even less relevant for people in ordinary people in a contemporary advanced post-industrial society. Its lessons are hard to operationalize on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, in any case, one would have to question the knock-on effects of the warfighting paradigm uh, of corporations led by overpaid gladiators, as it were. This is yesterday's model. So, by contrast, uh, the writings of Hanfei actually address, uh, as it turns out, uh, many of the problems in modern life much more directly, including those faced by CEOs. They are about power uh, and how to use it, but also about how to approach power or deal with it if you don't have it. They are about the dynamics of interpersonal relations within complex organizations. They are about the effects power has on information flows and of how knowledge and information are distorted in its presence. They are also about how to deal with bad people. In Hanfei's case, the context is feudal states, led, led by an hereditary ruler assisted by ministers and generals, organized in such a way as to maximize the wealth and power of the state and society and keep disorder at bay. In our own time, most of us who work, work in large organizations, led either by a CEO, a vice chancellor, a school principal, a department head, or a boss. Even in ostensibly democratic Western societies, democracy usually stops at the front door of the office block. And the organizational structure of reporting lines, supervisors, etc., takes over. So the issues we face in our working lives about Promotion or non-promotion, esteem or the lack of it, uh, performance reviews, access to the boss's ear, tend oddly enough not to be very different in general character from those faced by courtiers, ministers and advisors at the court of a Chinese feudal state. The moral dilemmas also tend to be oddly similar. What do you do about people who slander you, for example? When should you speak out and when should you hold your tongue? How much complicity is acceptable and how much is unacceptable? When do you draw the line? When should you blow the whistle? When do you walk away? All of these are very difficult issues. On these matters, actually, Hanfei discourses in great detail and depth in a way which is engaging, forthright, clear-sighted, and analytically incisive. He does this in a way which removes ethical considerations from what is essentially a discussion about the workings of political power per se and the effects of various kinds of action. I'll say something about Han Fei and his time. The time in which Han Fei lived at the close of the Warring States period 
has much in common with our own time, albeit at a different technological level. From the relatively ordered feudal and aristocratic society of the middle of the Zhou dynasty some centuries before, the kingdom of the Zhou had fallen apart into a congeries of feudal successor states at constant war with each other. The old ideals had fallen into a desuetude, and strong men battled it out. The closing decades of the Warring States period saw an increasingly intense arms race. Yes, they had them too back then. Between feudal states and the application of new methods of organization in the state apparatus, the army, and in the population at large. It was a time when states sought to maximize their wealth and power by increasing their efficiency. This was an age that saw the beginning of rational calculation of competitive advantage and efficiency and its application, indeed, to all areas of government operations and social organization of what two millennia later would blossom and become mathematical management. This period was also a time when itinerant advisors, the philosophers and the sophists, traveled around from court to court uh, trying to sell their advice to rulers who were becoming increasingly anxious about the survival of their states. So the philosophers were kind of like external consultants. If you bought their policy prescriptions, you had to feed them. Majority, a major school of such advisors were the Confucians. Confucius himself lived several centuries earlier, in the 5th century BCE, by all accounts, but already the decline of the Zhou was much in evidence. His prescriptions, I need to just go through them with you, his prescriptions for social ills and for good governance included the following, very briefly. First, a return to the ways of the ancient sage kings and the founding rulers of the Zhou dynasty. Secondly, a political order in which the ruler manifested the virtue of benevolence and ruled by example, spreading his moral influence throughout the kingdom. Third, a social order in which the observance of ritual and propriety served as the social cement. Fourth, respect for social hierarchy, a hierarchy of primary social relationships centered on the family, such as father-son, elder brother, younger brother, and so on and so forth. Fifth, the personal ethic for educated people, the so-called junza or gentlemen, gentle persons, that required them to act ethically regardless of the personal consequences and with no thought of future reward either in this life or in any hereafter. Sixthly, respect for learning and education regardless of social class. And finally, a cognitive order that is a way of conceiving and being in the world in which things in the outside world should be made to conform to their archetypes. Rulers should be rulers, fathers should be fathers, sons should be sons, and so forth and so on. In other words, people should conform to their ideal rules. The followers of Confucius, notably Mencius and Sinchen, further elaborated these ideas in the areas of statecraft. A great deal of the writings of Mencius, for example, are devoted to the question of how to make a state well-ordered, strong, and secure. The Mencian solution to this puts the spotlight on the moral qualities of the ruler himself. If the ruler acts ethically and exemplifies virtues such as benevolence, the people will support him and will be willing to act on his behalf. If not, not. Most of the tribulations suffered by rulers come as a result of their not acting ethically and not looking after the livelihoods of their subjects. Now, such Confucian arguments are persuasive. Solidarity is indeed fostered by an ethical disposition that recognizes human interconnectedness, benevolence, if you like. If it is the ruler who emanates this moral quality, the effect in society is much greater than if an ordinary person is good. However, this still leaves the problem of what to do with bad people. The Confucians divided human beings into two types, those who had some moral sense, the Jinza, and those who did not, the so-called Xiaoren, or little people. Uh, the little people were not physically small, but morally undeveloped or unteachable, uh, an underclass of moral dwarves, as it were, who thought only of their immediate self-interest. Little people were always in the absolute majority. 
in society. And the Confucian prescription, therefore, for good governance was, of course, to let the morally gen developed gentle people do the ruling. Most Confucians, oddly enough, had very little to say about the little people. The later Confucian philosopher Xunzi, who is famous for saying that human nature is originally bad, did at least try to address this question. In his view, it was through education that human beings who were born greedy and selfish would be brought up to become responsible ethical members of society. If the benefits of education could be made more generally available in society, then the number of hardcore bad people could eventually be minimized. This is all very well, but of course it leaves the immediate problem unsolved. And this is uh, in part where Han Fei and the legalists come in. Now, legalism has had a very bad press in the West and a very bad press in China. And it's worth, before we go on, to dwell on this for just a little bit. Um, I'll give two examples. Um, in the blurb, you would have noticed that I've said um, Han, Han Fei has been called a fascist. This is true. And I'd better tell you where this comes from. It comes from the writings of Guo Moro, an eminent man of letters, who for a long period of time during the 1950s and 50s and 60s was held up as a literatus laureate by the Chinese Communist Party. His words, therefore, carry considerable weight at the time. What he said was, the essays of Han Fei, such as Five Vermin and Eminence in Learning and the like, are entirely a fascist style theory. Now, Gu's argument was that Han Fei advocated concentrating power in the hands of the ruler of the feudal state, the Fuhrer, as it were, operating effectively what was a military dictatorship in which the masses were ground down under the weight of harsh and inflexible laws. Of course, Guomoro could have had no quarrel with the state monopoly on the means of production since this has always been Communist Party policy. Now, the other example comes, interestingly enough, from a textbook by John King Fairbank, the Harvard sinologist, who wrote The Great Tradition, East Asia, The Great Tradition, in 58 and republished in 1960. A textbook familiar to generations of American undergraduate students. This is worth quoting. What Fairbank says is, right to the legalists consisted simply in what the ruler desired. And then it goes on. In recent years, the legalists have often been called totalitarians. The name might be fully justified if they had had the technical means of popular control and propaganda of their 20th century counterparts. In terms of their own day, they were like the modern totalitarians, conservatives and innovators at the same time simple collection, uh, acceptance of royal absolutism, society of strict heart, hierarchy, blah, blah, blah. And then the concept of law is one of the glories of Western civilization. But in China, legalism, although it profoundly influenced the attitude towards the law, has been a despised term for more than 2,000 years. This is uh, at least partly true. This is because the legalist concept of law fell far short of the Roman. Whereas Western law has been conceived of as a human embodiment of some higher order of God or nature, the law of the legalists represented only the ruler's fiat. China developed little or no civil law to protect the citizen. Law remained largely administrative and penal and so forth. Despite the condemnation of later ages, legalism left a lasting mark on Chinese civilization through the triumph of the Qin. One could say that the legalist spirit is more obviously alive in communist China today than either Confucian morality or Taoistic nature mysticism. Well, how times have changed. But this is quite an extraordinary concoction. It is under the surface rather polemical and a serious distortion of Han Fei's teachings. Now, it cannot be the case that Fairbank did not have information at disposal to make a more balanced judgment. And it seems likely that what happened is that he simply absorbed and developed further the Confucian biases of his Chinese teacher without turning things over and inquiring further. 
um, we'll be going on to look at some actual passages in the Hanfei which deliberately, directly contradict uh, this very bleak assessment. Now, um, I'm not going to say very much about the biography of Hanfei. What there is available in the most uh, uh, the, the, the uh, most reliable form is confined to what um, is said in the historical records of Sima Qian, and it can fit on a single page. Basically, Han Feizi was the scion of the Han royal family, or princely family. Uh, he studied uh, the philosophies of the Yellow Emperor and Lao Tzu when he was, uh, when he was young, uh, he served as a minister in the Han uh, and for many years uh, tried to get his, uh, his advice uh, taken uh, very much in vain. Um, his writings, however, came to the attention of the Qin state. This was just before the Qin state uh, unified China and the chief minister Li Si uh, advised that uh, Han Fei be invited uh, to uh, visit the court of the Qin. And that is where he met his death um, at the hands uh, of Li Si and uh, the man who later became the first emperor of Qin. The work of Han Fei, uh, usually known just by the name Han Fei Zi, is one of the large, actually the largest bodies of philosophical writing that's come down to us from the classical period in China. Um, it's comprised five, 55 chapters in the current uh, version in 20 fascicles or juan, and it has a total length of something like uh, 100,000 characters. This is actually quite a large work. With all the ta chapters taken together, it can be, can be considered the equivalent of a complete treatise on statecraft. For some of the chapters, there are questions of authorship, not serious. It seems that some chapters did not reach their final version, uh, their final form until after Han Fei's death. Nevertheless, compared with the problems that beset other major works of the classical period, such as the Analects of Confucius or the Zhuangzi, these problems are very minor. Uh, at that time, anyway, authorship was regarded in a different way uh, from uh, the way we regard it now. It was less of a uh, matter of individual copyright and more of a collective creation by the philosophical school. Now, for the English reader, there's a translation by Burton Watson, uh, first published in the 1960s, recently reissued, um, covering 12 of the 55 chapters. And, and there is an older, complete translation um, into English done by W.K. Liao and published in 1959. Um, the translation by Watson is smoother and more contemporary, but both are equally good as guides to the Chinese original text. Um, the Chinese original text, by the way, uh, is much more elegant uh, than uh, either of the translations. Now, in this work, Han Fei covers not only the art of rulership with advice to the ruler, but also the art of effective advocacy as a minister or as an advisor. Overall, we can roughly classify the chapters under follow the following topic areas. The way of the ruler, the way of the advisor, the law, and vermin and tigers. I will deal with most of these topics in what follows. The way of the ruler, first, is the title of one of the chapters of this work. It is interesting that Han Fei's prescriptions for the effective use of power has the ruler operating in a way which is non-interventionist, non-transparent, and impartial. I'm not sure we would approve of all of his advice. The chief instrument of governance in uh, Han Fei's account is a clear and explicit code of laws, which the ruler implements without bias without bias towards his friends or against his enemies. The maintenance of a non-interventionist and non-active role is based closely on the formulations in the, in the Lao Tzu, um, in the, the Taoist school, especially the famous injunction in the Lao Tzu, also called the Dao De Jing, or the classic of the way and its power, to exercise 
uh, power, doing by not doing, way, way. The chapter entitled The Way of the Ruler, like the Lao Tzu, is cast in rhyme. Before of you, any of you gets too ex- culturally excited by this, I need to tell you a dark secret that rhyming prose and rhyming verse were the ancient Chinese equivalent of the executive summary. Um, Rhyme made things easier to remember. So memoranda, the things to remember, or the pithy essence of the teachings, were often put in the form of verse. Even a cursory reading of this chapter will indicate the extent to which Hanfei was indebted to Taoism for his concept of rulership. A more careful reading will show that this concept, contra Fairbank, is deeply philosophical and does indeed rest on an ethical and epistemological framework. The emphasis on disinterestedness and careful observation are part and parcel of what we could call an evidence-based approach to statecraft. It has been observed by Joseph Needham and others that Taoism preeminently among the three major schools of thought in China uh, was closest in spirit to modern science. And the empirical observations of the Taoists contributed greatly to the development of Chinese science and technological progress. This is pertinent. Evidently, statecraft was no exception. So I read to you from The Way of the Ruler. If it sounds a little bit old, that's because it is a little bit old. It is over two millennia old, and it's put in modern English.